Welcome, everybody, to Edge of the Rabbit Hole. We have a fantastic show coming up for you tonight. Author and paranormal investigator, researcher, and really a man of all things, David Weatherly is in the house. Coming up next. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to Edge of the Rabbit Hole. I'm author and ghost story, and Mike Ricksecker. With me, as always, my co host is Victoria Monday. And down in the chat room, Alina moderating the chat. We have a great guest for you this evening. My old friend David Weatherly is with us to talk about black eyed children, strange encounters, all kinds of different supernatural activity in the world. Uh, he's a an author, researcher, world traveler. He a uh, very learned man. You can basically pick his brain about any of these topics. And very uh, happy to have him on the show this evening. David, welcome to Edge of the Rabbit Hole. Hey guys, thanks for having me on. Hey David. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a little while since I've had a chance to uh, to pick your brain. And you know, we're <laughs> we're featuring black eyed children tonight because you're kind of the uh, you know the foremost expert on on these things. And, you know, I have, I have the old book here, but, um, you know, I love the, the new cover for, for black eyed children. Of course, we have all the links down in the description so people can uh, go ahead and, and find the book, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll start at the beginning here. You know, how did you, uh, get an interest in this, in this subject, which is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So this is one of those things that, um, you know, the, the stories about the black eyed children, they, they started circulating on the internet in uh, the late nineties. And at the time it was uh, kind of a curiosity for me. Of course, it, it came on my radar because it was, you know, weird and in the whole paranormal spectrum of things. Uh, but the, the problem with it was that initially the stories were only online and they were sort of right on the edge. They sounded like they could be, urban myth or, uh, you know, maybe just out and out hoaxes. And it was very difficult to reach anyone who had actually uh, encountered these figures. So I just kind of kept watch on the phenomenon and, and put it in the, the mental filing cabinet. Uh, for some time, that's where it stayed until I met a gentleman who started telling me about an experience he'd had. And he had encountered uh, what sounded like the black eyed children. In fact, when he got down to the full description, that's what he described. You know, these strange kids that had solid black eyes. Uh, so it really intrigued me because now here was an account that I could sort of uh, really dig into a little bit and ask the person questions. And I decided to pursue it from there. So, uh, you know, that was the early days of the internet and it was very difficult to get a lot of information on different topics. And I still relied on my old network of investigators from around the world. So I kind of started putting feelers out and, and asking people and eventually other encounters started coming into me. Uh, so eventually, uh, you know, I just decided at some point, Hey, I think I'll just write a, a book about this because there certainly is enough material. And, and the most fascinating aspect for me at the time was the fact that these encounters, there wasn't a very clear way to classify them. You could look at it and say, well, uh, these could be some kind of uh, ghost encounters, uh, but you could look at it a different way and say, well, these seem like they're connected to the, the notorious MIB that are UFO related. And again, the more I dug into the topic, the more curious connections I found. So uh, eventually what happened was, of course, the Black Eyed Children book that examines all the potential possibilities for what these weird figures actually are. I don't believe for a moment they're actually children, uh, but the connections to other types of phenomena, that's very intriguing. And I kind of use the book as a way to uh, present those possibilities and give cases for each possibility that sort of reinforced that uh, potential. So it's a chapter on the potential that they're alien hybrids and it has some cases that kind of emphasize those aspects and so forth and really wanted let, to let people decide for themselves what they thought of the whole matter and uh i think i was successful with it yeah absolutely having read your work and i do need to pick up the revised edition but having read it and studied it because you know my book a walk in the shadows you know i get the question when it comes to shadow people are you know, are black-eyed children shadow entities which you know 
I, I don't believe they are, but, you know, so I did, you know, go ahead and dig into, well, David's got, you know, all the information on this. Let me, <laughs> let me dig in here and study a little bit, um, you know, because it's, you know, it's a very, um, to me, you know, kind of an all-inclusive work. You, you lay out so many different scenarios of what they could be. You have so many different uh, accounts of interactions with these children. I think everybody kind of wants to know, uh, you know, because the whole thing about the black eyed children is they want into the house. They, they want to be invited in. So what actually happens when you invite them in? <laughs> That's sort of the million dollar question in some ways, because uh, now I'll tell you right up front, if you go online and, and start researching that, you're going to get tons of stories of uh, people who claim they let them inside and, and all these various things happen to them. And uh, a few of those, you know, early on, I tried to contact some of those people. And of course, they don't respond back. That doesn't necessarily mean the accounts are, aren't valid. Uh, I have found through my experience researching this this topic that most people who have encountered these children, they are very uh, often very reluctant to talk about the topic. Uh, they're they're still they're traumatized. Essentially, they're they're trauma victims because of what they've gone through in, in dealing with these kids. So it's often hard to get uh, details or, or get, you know, extensive things from some of these people. The more direct the encounter was, it's often uh, the more difficult to get information from them. I will say that uh, I've talked to a handful of people who were in close proximity to these kids and all evidence indicates that the closer the encounter uh, the more negative the con the results are. So I have talked to people who have been touched by these kids or, or have actually reached out and touched the kids themselves and have had terrible experiences in the aftermath. You know, they've become physically ill and so forth. Uh, there is one story in the book, it's, it's a bit long, uh, that deals with a woman and her child uh, and a very close encounter with a black-eyed uh, kid. And the result of that was, uh, again, was some pretty nasty consequences. It was sickness and uh, other negative uh, domino effects that resulted from being in close proximity to this kid. So, you know, again, all the indications to me are these aren't children at all, but they're some kind of very negative entity. Yeah. Victoria? I have so many questions. <laughs> I Go ahead. always thought it was an urban legend and so I started digging into it and I I went down a rabbit hole basically. You know, I have a, what happens? I mean, can they come in unless or are they like vampires they can't come in unless you invite them in or that was one of the questions and do they only appear at night? Have you ever seen them or has anyone ever seen them during the day cuz that leads to like five more different questions. Okay. So <laughs> Uh, first question, there is a whole comparison done in the book of the similarities with vampire folklore, which I found very fascinating because, uh, you know, we're sort of going back to a, a core mythology in a sense. You go back to traditional vampire tales, which, of course, have evolved a lot over the years and, and right. through literature and so forth. But what you find is that the modern Black Eyed Kid accounts, they sort of read like a, a casebook vampire encounter in some ways there there is no indication at all that they can enter without being invited inside in some fashion and that's sort of bizarre when you think about it uh, there's so many accounts of, the, of these kids showing up and the the people who are encountering them uh, they go through different different phases of trying to reconcile what they're seeing you know they're they, they the psychological component comes in. And I think this is very strange because what happens is that people are seeing children who are asking for help. Now, as adults, we're hardwired to say, OK, what can we do? You know, if 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 a kid walks up to either one of you on the street and says, I, I need I need help, you know, I'm lost or I need water or something. Your gut reaction, your automatic reaction is to do anything you can. But if but if all your personal warning signs are being activated that something's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, those danger signals, whether it's the, the hair on the back of the neck or the arms or the queasiness in the stomach, whatever it is, if that's going on at the same time, that creates this weird psychological battle within a person's uh, mind because they're, they're not sure 
how to respond, you know, right. how to how to deal with this scenario. So uh, that's usually the case that uh, occurs when these um, these encounters take place. And when the kids press for entry, it generally causes a, a real spike in fear for the person right. who's encountering them. So they, they end up, you know, shutting them out or slamming the door, running away, whatever the, the circumstances dictate. So it's interesting that, again, we have this link with, with vampire lore that uh, there is no indication. I've never heard a case where they've barged in. And the opportunity is there because, right. you know, they're often standing on the threshold of a, of a home or business, uh, hotel rooms, you know, any number of things where the door is wide open and the opportunity is there. They could rush in if they wanted to, but it never happens. It never, they want that invitation inside. Well, I have two thoughts now. Um, first of all, you know, they're black eyes. So the eyes are like the windows to the soul. So if we can't perceive a person's eye, do you think that's one thing that terrorizes them? And my other thought was if they're only seen at night, children go to bed early at night. So is that why maybe perhaps they're children because they're like using the images of kids who might be out on the astral plane or something or. Yeah, I guess I didn't get to that question. So <laughs> in, in general, <laughs> most of the encounters, most of the encounters, uh, if, if you look at them as a whole, like a database as a whole, mm -hmm. and, and I, first of all, I don't profess to have all the accounts I can tell you because I know a lot of other researchers that get these, uh, accounts all the time you know these these things are cropping up all over the world uh, however i've talked to a lot of those people and in general most of the cases uh, the encounters do seem to occur right around early evening you know just as the sun is going down but there are exceptions there are indeed some daytime encounters there are people who have seen them in in the early morning hours uh, sometimes in a broad daylight uh, it's it's nowhere near as as frequent as the other encounters, however. But you know, once again, it, I think you have to step back from the spookiness of the phenomena and say, let's look at the bare facts and let's consider that there is an intelligence that's operating here that is fully aware of exactly what it's doing and what kind of scenario it's trying to create. So if you take the, the specific elements, you know, just as the sun is starting to go down or just after it's gone down, that's kind of a spooky time, mm -hmm. you know, because the, the sky is changing, it's getting dark, uh, you yeah. know, it's right on the border of, of night and day, the, the nocturnal animals are just starting to stir. So you have all these elements that come into play uh, that I think adds to the atmosphere, if you will of yeah. the encounters. And in another sense, you have a lot of uh, people who are what's happening around that time of the day for them. You know, mm -hmm. they're just getting off work. They're trying to shake off the, the cares of the day. They're starting to get into that relaxed mode. You know, they're ready for dinner or they're ready to go have a beer or whatever it is. <laughs> so there's a, a different level. The defenses are starting right. to shift down in a different way because you're not out dealing with the public. So, I think, again, if we consider exactly what is in operation here, then we start to understand why these encounters generally occur around those times. With all the um, the technology now, like you know, everyone's got a, you know, gas stations have cameras. We all have ring doorbells. Has anyone actually recorded them? I mean, have we seen them? That's a good uh, question. <laughs> it's, it's not one that a lot of people ask. Uh, no. There have been a few occasions where these things have shown up uh, when security cameras were present. Mm -hmm. And what do you think happens? <laughs> There's a malfunction. Goes, ah, it's, it's me at work. No. <laughs> There's a malfunction. So, uh, you know, I, I've talked to, oh, I don't know, probably a, a couple dozen people or so who have had these encounters where security cameras were present. And they always find that something unusual has occurred. Uh, a few occasions I, I've heard that the cameras were turned off for some unexplained reason, you know, all oh, the, yeah. the previous shift must have turned them off or, you know, whatever. Uh, but equally there have been occasions where, you know, the, the power has gone out. So the cameras weren't running or there was a glitch in the, 
almost a glitch in the matrix, but <laughs> a glitch in the cameras, you know, so right. there's this gap where the recording is, is occurring. And to jump into a, another aspect of this, that sort of leaps over to the idea that they have connections with the, the men in black because oh, men in black encounters, <laughs> their, uh, their notorious aspects of those encounters wherein electronic interference crops up, you know, something, uh, the phones misbehave, cameras don't operate and so forth. So once again, we see this, the kind of overall weirdness of the, this phenomenon, how it's interrelated to all these different types of, of strange encounters. That was going to be my next question. Um, and you made me think of something. If things are going on the fritz when they're around, maybe they're putting out some sort of EMF field or something that disrupts, you know, like a solar flare or something that disrupts video. Um, but do you think they're like little junior men in black or men in black's children or, or future <laughs> men in black or baby in black? Oh, baby in black. You know, <laughs> men in black. <laughs> uh, I, there are some people who think that they're definitely connected to the men in black. I pers that's not my personal belief. Okay. Uh, but, you know, again, there's a lot of arguments to be made for various connections that these things have to other types of phenomena. Do they show up like an Maybe there are some sort of interdimensional uh, beings then? Yeah. Or are they related to UFO sightings in any way? Well, uh, might just hit on my personal belief. <laughs> I, I believe, you know, after, after all the years of research, I believe that they are interdimensional beings and I, I don't believe that they're um, positive in nature at all. Uh, I think they're, I think they're here for a few different reasons because that's probably uh, the next question from one of you. <laughs> I, I think that, <laughs> you know, I, I think that on one basic level, they're sort of testing uh, because if you look at these encounters, there is a bit of an evolution in terms of how they have dealt with people. They seem to, very subtly adjust things as the encounters move forward through the years. Uh, and on the other level, I believe that they are, and this will sound creepy, but I think in some form they feed on the interactions and, you know, emotions are a very powerful thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are, are some traditions and some beliefs that, you know, things can feed on emotions uh, and fear is a very strong emotion. Uh, what I find in most of these encounters is that the children interact long enough to create a spike of fear in the victim. And that is the moment that they disappear. They're gone. And it's as if they got exactly what they came for. Hmm. Okay. I have one Some more sort question. Of energy vampire, maybe. I'm <laughs> sorry. I was asking. So some kind of energy vampire, maybe. Yeah, possibly. Go ahead, Victoria. Okay. Two more questions and then I'll quit. Um, so they're around <laughs> the world. It's a around the world phenomenon, right? Oh, yes. Okay. So they're not limited to the United States. They can. Not at all. Be in Russia or wherever. Okay. Um, did they, did they happen before 1996? Cause I, we have a common friend and we were talking yesterday and he was telling me about his experience. Um, but they happened before 1996, right? Absolutely. Well, okay. Cause that was my thought was in 1995, the X-Files was huge and they did this whole thing yeah. on black eyed. And I was wondering if perhaps we created, what's the word? Tup, tup, yeah, that, that was the, uh, the oil, oil mm -hmm. aliens that uh, possess people's bodies. I remember that. Well, a lot of skeptics uh, try to point to the Bethel encounter and mm -hmm. say, Oh no, this is, this is a modern myth. It, it started uh, during Brian Bethel, you know, with Brian Bethel's encounter and it went forward from there and it's all a creepy pasta type of thing or so forth. But it happened before that too, right? It, it really did. Uh, okay. The, here's the big, here's the big difference. Brian Bethel did a very key thing when he shared his encounter online. He applied the identifying name and acronym, mm -hmm. uh, B-E-K, Black Eyed Kid. So people who take a, a very cursory look at this phenomena, that's what they research. And of course, you know, one of my pet peeves, modern researchers, they think all the answers are on the Internet. <laughs> uh, I've heard of a most, book. I, yeah. I, I will say most of the wrong answers are on the Internet. Uh, so you've got something there. However, 
uh, if, if you really want to dig into something, I, I'm old school. I started doing this stuff in the 70s. And, you know, I, I use this weird thing called libraries, uh, you know, newspapers, <laughs> what are those? talking, <laughs> talking to people <laughs> uh, and, and getting personal accounts and opinions right. and so forth. So the thing is, is that, uh, you know, when I started digging into the phenomena, that was actually one of the first things I wanted to do was to see how substantial it was and to see, OK, is this a modern phenomena that has just started cropping up for whatever reason or is it something much older? Mm -hmm. The key in doing that was removing that acronym, was removing the terminology and searching for the parameters of the encounters. And when I did that, the floodgates kind of open because uh, since that time and, it, it, you know, since the initial research, countless accounts have, have cropped up that myself and other researchers have dug up from old journals and, and old, you know, uh, paranormal or Fortean publications and so forth. And they would find these accounts. And, and so did I. Oh, here's this weird encounter. It was identified at the time as possibly being. Uh, extraterrestrial, or maybe it's a ghost story or whatever. But when you read the details, all the details fit the same parameters of these modern black eyed kid encounters. You know, some differences, slight differences, but the key things are there. The weird pale skin, the solid black eyes, uh, the, the demands for, uh, you know, for something, for coming in a home or whatnot. Uh, but you have to look at it through a different cultural lens and understand that, you know, people in 1950 weren't going to report a BEK encounter because they didn't know what that was. Right. Uh, you know, there's a, there's an account in the book from the 1950s that happened in rural Virginia. And uh, this this family, you know, after this encounter, they decided uh, the young man who, who saw the black eyed kid, they decided, oh, Harold's uh, met the devil. You know, we have to go down and, and see the preacher because that's how they can identify it. Here's a, a kid with these weird black eyes. He, he's acting very strangely. He's something demonic. So looking through those um, those different lenses gives you a whole range of encounters that have taken place through the decades. You have to admit, all kids are a little demonic every now and then. But uh, <laughs> I was Especially a Girl Scout teenagers. leader. Uh, oh, geez, they can be was, a little hellions, yeah. I was a Girl mm -hmm. Scout leader for a long time. Well, how far back do these go? I mean, were we talking hundreds of years? or? It, you know, it's really a difficult question to answer, but I'll tell you this. Uh, I encountered something. This is not in the book because Ooh. it's something that I became aware of uh, after um, – after the book initially came out, uh, there is, are you guys familiar with Gobekli Tepe? Yeah, absolutely. Archaeological site. Oh, uh, okay. So they discovered a statue in Gobekli Tepe. At the time, um, it was the only humanoid statue at the site. It is, uh, and you'll, you'll forgive me, I, I can't recall the exact age of this thing at the moment. It's thousands of years old. Uh, the only humanoid figure at the site, all the site's uh, icons were carved from stone. So they're stone animals or stone, you know, just different, different images. Yeah, the site itself is like a good 10,000 years old. It's yeah. I'm thinking the statue I'm referring to, I think it's dated to 10,500 uh, years okay. old and it's called the Urfa man. Now, for some reason, when they carved the statue, the ancients who, who did the work, they carved it out of stone like they did everything else. It's a humanoid figure. It, it uh, is kind of exaggerated features. It has some kind of a belt on. But they did something they didn't do with any of the other images at the site. They went somewhere and they mined black obsidian and they mounted them in the eyes. So this is a, a 10,000 plus year old statue with solid black eyes. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I, I've not been to the site myself. Uh, Robert Schock is a friend of mine. He, he's been there numerous times. Uh, and a few other people that I know, researcher Linda Moulton Howe has been there. Uh, so I've talked to several people who have been to the site and, and looked at this Earth Man sort of stood, you know, face to face, so to speak, with it. And they all report that it is a very unsettling experience. 
because there's something so strange about this humanoid statue with solid black eyes. Now, the question I pose, of course, is why in the world, <laughs> you know, yeah. did they do this? Because, you know, humans throughout history don't have solid black eyes. Uh, it's, you know, you can't really medically have solid black eyes and survive unless you, unless you get your eyes tattooed, eyeballs tattooed, which is a very new thing. But uh, yeah, so the point these. being, yeah. So the point being, you know, what exactly were they trying to convey with this statue? Uh, that to me, I, I think it's a somewhat chilling indication that this presence, whatever these kids represent, that this is a presence that has been here on the earth for a very long time. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah, and Victoria, you actually went right down the route where I wanted to go because you know how I am. Put me that rabbit hole history, there. But that's great. That's great because that, <laughs> yeah, I got to a lot of those questions. Because, yeah, I mean, we you, you have that connotation these days, uh, as, you know, along with a lot of other, you know, supernatural phenomena that we talk about where people believe it's, you know, it, it's something that's newer that, you know, maybe the Internet has proliferated or what have you. But if you yeah. actually dig back into the history, you find that, you no, know, these things have been around for a long long time maybe you're just lucky that nobody's trying to trademark black-eyed children <laughs> <laughs> hurry so, yeah <laughs> trademark yeah <laughs> so i want to get some uh, questions from the chat here uh we'll start with uh sarah yusuf she asks does david believe that black-eyed children are predatory in that entities that may mimic children prey on the belief that children are seen as innocent. Uh, absolutely. And that's sort of what I was referring to earlier. You know, I, I think one of the reasons that these entities appear in the form of children is that, uh, you know, that that is an innocent form. And as I, I noted earlier, it's, it catches an adult off guard. You know, if a child, comes up to you, almost every adult, you know, even adults who don't like kids, you know, they're going to say, okay, well, you know, kids lost or something. I, I better do whatever I can. So I do. I, I think it's a very uh, devious way to sort of gain entry, if you will. And, uh, you know, in terms of being predators, that is a common word that people use when they have encountered these kids. They say that they feel like they've been in the presence of a predator. And uh, that's part of what traumatizes people so much uh, in the midst of these encounters. And then we have one here from Pungai Fungi. What evidence are there for their existence other than the stories? Well, I'm not sure uh, what kind of evidence you would expect, you know, <laughs> uh, we deal with a lot of strange phenomena that there's not necessarily evidence for except for uh, experiences. You know, that's uh, when we get into paranormal phenomena, whether it's black eyed kids or ghosts or, or UFOs or whatever, you know, and, and people ask, well, where's the evidence? That's, that's kind of like asking, where's the evidence for God? Uh, but at the same time, you know, where's the evidence to prove that this is not happening? Yeah, exactly. It, it's kind of mm -hmm. tough, you know, when, we could show a video of, you know, chair moving that we had, you know, nothing to do with. We didn't touch. And right. anybody could say, well, you know, that that footage was doctor. So same thing with, I would think, with black eyed children. And one of the crazy things about that is, you know, all of the electronic failures when these things show up, which I think is absolutely fascinating because. That's right. Yeah. That, that kind of lends to the idea that there's something extra going on there. Mm hmm. So um, I know we have some others here. Let me kind of scroll down through. Um, but we kind of um, kind of answered that one. So this one, uh, Sarah, other accounts of black eyed children wearing branded clothing. <laughs> <laughs> branded clothing. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, not that I've ever heard. You know, I mean like, I mean, it's a logical question, you know, yeah, they have yeah. Nike sneakers on or, or anything like that. Actually, no, there's not. And in fact, uh, one of the curiosities of these encounters is that, uh, you know, these these kids, they never have the common things you would expect a, a teenager or a preteen or, or even a young child these days to have. You know, there's there are no reports of them with a cell phone in hand or an iPod 
or, uh, you know, having their headsets, a headset plugged in or anything like that. So uh, we get these indications that they're, they're mimicking kids, but they don't know exactly how to do it. And, you know, that, uh, that's kind of reflected in this idea that it's, it's rare to hear, uh, you know, I always ask, uh, does this kid have any kind of blemish, uh, you know, pimples, uh, in, anything like this? No, they never do. Uh, there's never anything very distinguishing. Uh, there's never a scar or anything like that. No jewelry. Uh, none of these things that you would look for to distinguish a, an individual, so to speak. And, uh, Branded clothing certainly would fall within those same parameters. I, I've never heard of a of an encounter of someone seeing, oh, they were wearing, you know, Gucci sweats. <laughs> no, no hoodies or anything. No. Well, hoodies, usually yeah, something but like nothing. drab, really, like really drab clothing, right? Yeah, you, usually it's uh, well. There's there's two sort of distinct groupings they fall into. One is that uh, people say they have old fashioned or ill fitting clothing. You know, as if it was oh, it's past it looked like it was passed down from an older sibling or something like that. Or, it, you know, some people say it looks uh, Amish, you know, like it was handmade or, or that kind of thing. And then on the, on the flip side and actually more of the cases, what you hear is they were wearing very indistinct clothing. It was, it was black or gray or, or, you know, like a drab Brown, uh, but nothing distinctive on it. Uh, usually just uh, jeans and a, a hoodie or, you know, just a plain shirt. Interesting. So we have a uh, five dollar super chat here from Robert Hanna. He says, "Great show tonight, Mike and Victoria. Aww. Thank you very much, Robert, for the five dollar super chat. Absolutely appreciate that." Robert's a big fan uh, of the PE case. Yes. So we had a, uh, a question here from our chat moderator, Alina. She asked, "Does it seem like the Black Eyed Kids are anything like the Hatman?" You did kind of talk a little bit about that earlier. Yeah, you know, they they do share a few things with some of these entities, but really when we start getting into the hat man or shadow people and those types of things, uh, I covered that in my Strange Intruders book, and mm -hmm. there's really not much crossover there other than the fact that, you know, they kind of show up out of nowhere and, and take people unawares, I think. So uh, you could draw some comparisons, but certainly not as strong as some of the other uh, connecting points that they have with different types of phenomena. Yeah, and that kind of leads into this one here, T. Cheney. Any relation to specters with a black hole as a face? So, we, I mean, people could probably ask all night: Are they any relation to these, you know, other types of entities? Yeah, yeah, and you know, when it gets down to it, I mean, it's it's really difficult to to say. Okay, well, yes, they are connected to that. Uh, I think, in a sense, you know, that the things we deal with as researchers and investigators. I, I take a very holistic approach. I was, uh, you know, I knew John Keel. He was a big influence on me. And, and he had a very uh, holistic viewpoint of all of this weird phenomena that goes on in the world and, and felt that on some level it was all interconnected. And I kind of believe the same thing uh, from just from various things I've studied. There are indications to me that there's there's some kind of consciousness that's sort of behind all of the strange phenomena so to that degree we could say yeah it's it's all related but uh distinct phenomena no you know you can you can kind of argue all day well they can be this or they can be that and i tried to cover the most prominent ones in the book uh that that offer the most evidence for a clear connection have you ever seen one or them group no mm. Do you want um, to? I, I have not personally. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so let's get into some of your other work here, Dave, because you, you do a lot more other than just black eyed children, but that is kind of a, a, a popular topic that you, you're known for researching. Uh, you have a new book that has come out here and let me get that up here. Uh, Haunted prisons. So you have like a whole series Ooh. of these, like, uh, I have the haunted churches over here. Uh, here. Let's see. Can I take that off? Okay, there we go. So, like, I have the haunted churches. So, you have a whole series here that you're putting together, and the, the latest one is Haunted Prisons. Uh, tell us a little about this uh, book series and specifically the, the haunted prisons. Yeah, so this is a series that uh, I developed with a friend of mine, a fellow researcher, Ross Allison, who's uh, out of Seattle. And he and I just wanted to. Uh, 
you know, we started kicking around some ideas one day and, and wanted to do a series of books that shared some of these iconic ghost stories that are out there and, and also share some of the ones that are much lesser known so that they're not lost uh, to history, so that they're down somewhere in, in writing. So we started off with haunted toys. Uh, we thought that was a, a very unusual topic that surprisingly no one had covered at that point. And uh, we moved on to haunted ships and lighthouses. And we've been doing these and kind of interspersing sort of lesser addressed topics uh, like haunted churches uh, and then topics that other people have addressed, but hopefully with our own our own twist. And uh, we've both done tons of investigations and research over the years. Uh, you know, Ross, is, uh, Ross has been investigating for 30 some years and I'm uh, I don't even know how many years now <laughs> since since the 1970s. So I've got 40 some years in the field and, you know, having experienced a lot of these places, uh, we decided to get some of these stories down. Haunted Prisons is the latest one. It's only been out uh, about a month. And I can tell you it was the most challenging one to write. Uh, people ask me all the time, you know, are, are, are you afraid of anything because of the places I go and the things I do? And, you know, my answer is always that I, I'm not <laughs> the, the paranormal and the, the creepy things, things like that don't really disturb me. What disturbs me is uh, what humans can do to other humans. Yeah. And this book, uh, you know, we really had to kind of dig into some pretty disturbing stories. And, and these, uh, you know, these sites, these haunted prisons, uh, there's a good reason that they're such hotbeds of paranormal energy. Uh, because you go behind those walls and, and it's a different world very much a different world. Uh, you know, over the decades, a whole prison culture has sprung up and, uh, you know, they have their own language to a degree. And, and uh, the, the amount of energy that's in these places. And, and Mike, I know you know this, uh, we, you and I have been in a couple of these kinds sure. of locations together and uh, you can feel the disturbed energy. Um, perfect example is Moundsville Prison in West Virginia. Uh, so much history, uh, so much trauma, you know, people were electrocuted there. Um, but, you know, they're, they're the, the violence of the prisoners that they, um, the violent actions they did to each other, you know, once they were inside, let alone what they did outside. And, you know, suddenly they're in a confined space uh, <laughs> that is sort of a generator for paranormal activity. So uh, this stuff gets embedded in the location. You know, we've got Moundsville that saw so many uh, disturbing incidents and there's still a lot of spirits lingering in there. Uh, and anyway, uh, <laughs> I ramble a little bit there, but the point <laughs> is, you know, we, we, uh, we address some of the worst prisons in the country. And uh, this book covers prisons and penitentiaries. Uh, it does not cover jails simply because we realized once we got into it that the, the sort of prison penitentiary side of it was much more uh, disturbing and brutal and uh, would have been a massive tome if we tried to cover them all. So we hit some of the highlights and some lesser known ones. And there you go. Did you cover any um, active well, I know they're all active. Any um, currently in use um, facilities or are these all ones that have been closed down? Yeah, and we did. We did cover a few that are still in operation. Uh, I uh, addressed Folsom Prison, oh, uh, okay. which, you know, famous for Johnny Cash Johnny. You know, the concert there. Uh, but it's also a haunted site. Now, obviously, you can't get in and investigate that. Uh, if, you, <laughs> if you get in, you're not there to investigate. <laughs> you're not getting out, you know. <laughs> but, um, but there are some intriguing stories that have come from that prison. And, and it's one of the ones that had this whole weird tale of, of a, uh, a figure that prisoners claim exists inside the walls, this thing they are calling Dead Ringer that takes the form of, uh, it's kind of a doppelganger in a sense. It takes the form of other prisoners and it's, it's this evil omen. Uh, you read the stories from, you know, the prisoner who's telling this and it's kind of 
it's almost like a, a B movie plot and you're thinking, mm -hmm. okay, come on. Well, <laughs> but at the yeah. same time, you know, you, you've got people who believe in the existence of this thing and are talking about experiences with it. And it is a haunted, haunted prison. You know, there are guards who talk about strange mm -hmm. activity occurring there. So uh, there's something going on behind the walls. Yeah. I'm just down the road. Well, okay. In Texas term, I'm just down the road from the death capital of Texas. You know, we have like, when I went to school at Huntsville, I thought there were like seven or eight prisons that circled the city. Right. And, you, and my friends, the guards would, they would come up with some of the craziest stories. And I started thinking, well, maybe all the iron, like in the iron in the buildings, iron in the bars, iron in the, the webbing they have on the window, maybe that mm -hmm. helps hold some of the energy in. It could be. I mean, you know, psychologically, you've got people who have been locked away and and their uh, energy is contained. Uh, you know, a lot of these a lot of these facilities are uh, housing people are in for multiple life sentences. They're never coming oh, yeah. out of those places. Uh, so, you know, imagine that sort of containment. Some of the older penitentiaries are built of uh, limestone or other materials that possibly hold yeah. energy and yeah. you know we we could get into a lot of different reasons why some of these places might be uh haunted beyond the activity that takes place inside and again i think it's part of what adds to the overall uh, creation of of such a hotbed of of activity mm -hmm. you can definitely feel it because um death row in texas is right across the street from my favorite hamburger joint um and you can just feel <laughs> They have a, a hamburger there called Get Old some Sparky. Haunted hamburgers? It's called Old Sparky. Come on. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> a killer oh, burger. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. It just goes wow. on and on. Okay. Yeah. It's a fun town, let me tell you. But um, you can feel that kind of when you go by it and all the prisons that are around the school. You can. It, and, you know, the thing mm -hmm. is, is that if you talk about you, you can sort of isolate some of that and, and look at a singular aspect, you go into a haunted prison and you go into, you know, cell whatever that held mm -hmm. a notorious murderer. And the energy is different in that cell. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether the person was was executed or, or died of natural causes or whatever happened there, you know, that's contained energy because, oh, here's a guy that was in for multiple life sentences. He was in here for, you know, 40 years before he died. Uh, so every day in that cell, you know, concentrating okay. that energy and that's just his energy. That's not even accounting for uh, the victims or the things that he did, you know, to others that may have an influence on that. Uh, and this is, you know, this is something that you find. Uh, another good example is this. Uh, this is a, a site that Mike did uh, with me uh, a number of years ago, Fox Hollow Farms. Oh, and wow. Yeah. That I, I tell you a flashback, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's one of the, the most disturbing places I, I've ever been in personally. Because, you know, this was the home of a serial killer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're, you're walking around this home with this conscious awareness that this guy did all of these, you know, very disturbing acts in those rooms. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the presence and the energy of that is still there. It's palpable. Yeah. yeah and we're walking around the woods where they're, they are still finding bones. It's Oh, jeez. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah. 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 So so <laughs> Let me ask this, David, because we we're talking about uh, Ireland uh, before the show started. Have you been to or investigated Spike Island Prison? <laughs> I I haven't done that one. No, I, I've I've done a a couple of other um, former prisons or, or jails in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're slated to do that one uh, next summer, uh, July oh, nice. uh, 2022. So that'll be interesting. I was just curious mm -hmm. as, if, as if you had any experiences or what you what you may have felt there. Um, yeah, yeah, I love I love yeah. Ireland. There's some incredible places there, and a whole you know a whole different level of history and uh, energy and everything else. It's a fantastic place. Come along, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your wife. She's from there, right? <laughs> So I also want to ask you about um, the other one. This is your Alaska book, Monsters on the Last Frontier. Now, you have a whole different series of uh, books. 
uh, which you know, you've put out so many books lately. And uh, this one, of <laughs> course, being Alaska, you know, I have a personal connection to and the, the mm-hmm. cover art again is beautiful. So uh, what got you into covering uh, all these different, well, I mean, this is basically cryptids up in Alaska. So what got you started on this series and uh, what can we learn from you here? So that's a series. There are, uh, it's hard for me to keep up now. I think there are five of those out now. The The new one just came out. Um, it's Monsters of the Tar Heel State, which is North Carolina, Cryptids and Legends in North Carolina. Alaska is actually the third one I did. And uh, I think it surprised a few people, but uh, I, I've probably had more comments on that book than uh, any of the others in, in some ways. People are so fascinated and intrigued with Alaska. And uh, I've spent time up there and, and just... Uh, decided, wow, there's so many stories. You can see it's a, it's a fairly thick book. Uh, had to kind of pick and choose to a certain degree. But uh, to answer your question, Mike, I, I got started on this series because of uh, someone saying to me one day, uh, they made a comment about Nevada. And they said, oh, well, there's not really any cryptids in Nevada. You know, there's just aliens. There's aliens out there, but it's not really any cryptids. <laughs> And I kind of laughed at that. I, I guess part of me took it as a challenge. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I've researched in pretty much every state and I have years and years of files. And, I, you know, right off the top of my head, I said to this person, are you kidding? You know, there's there's Sasquatch sightings in Nevada. There's uh, Tahu Tessie, which is in the lake. And, um, you know, I, I started digging into these files and I thought, wow, I've got a lot of stuff that people probably haven't heard from Nevada. And, uh So I wrote a book. I called it Silver State Monsters. Uh, It was the first one in this series, and it was so well received uh, that I, right after that, went over and did Arizona, um, which was was easy for me to do, too. I had so much material from there. Uh, That's Copper State Monsters. And then, of course, people started asking, are you going to do more of these? I I love this series. (laughs) So I thought, well, you know, I had just gotten back from a, a trip to Alaska, and I thought, Wow. You know, and I just heard some incredible accounts and I thought, go ahead and do Alaska. (laughs) So it just kind of kept going. You know, I did Alaska and then I did uh, Indiana and now the latest one, North Carolina. And there's another one about to be announced probably within uh, two, three weeks. You'll see the cover debut for for each state. Yeah, uh, well, that's what everybody <laughs> wants me to do. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Say, yes, it's a, it's a lot of work. But, um, you know, I, I've I've really gotten my writing mojo the last couple of years. So uh, I've gotten to the point where I can kind of write anywhere and at any time. So, um, yeah, it's just a matter of, of getting enough time with all my other projects and everything else to get all 50 out. But uh, it'd be a heck of a legacy if I end up doing that, I guess, in terms wow. of the zoology. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Did you get the chupacabra yeah. in there? I mean, he's still big here. Uh, that's a big Texas thing. Uh, there's not really. <laughs> yeah, there's not really. Uh, so I haven't done Alaska. Texas. I haven't done Texas yet. Well, but, no, uh, I mean. Yeah, no chupacabras in, in Alaska. So. No, no, no. I mean. When you get to Texas, would you put the chupacabra in there? Oh yeah, definitely. I I try to cover all of the, all of the, you know, main cryptids that are found in the state. And I dig up a lot of things that people haven't heard of before, Um, you know, old accounts. And sometimes they're things I've gotten personally from the witnesses, or sometimes they're just old historic accounts. You know, I like to dig into native folklore uh, or native lore and traditional folklore and other early accounts, everything that I can find to sort of show the evolution of what's happened in these individual areas. Uh, the Alaska book, you know, there was so much material for it. In fact, uh, Mike and I were talking at one point, you know, I've, I've got material. Too. Yeah. I've got material for a whole nother oh, wow. uh, Alaska book. That's not, that's not cryptids. Uh, so, you know, hopefully, uh, We'll see if that one gets out this year, hope, hoping that it will. Yes, Alaska surprisingly has a, a lot you know, going on up there. And I, I spent three years up there, as you well know, and of course mm-hmm. the Alaska Triangle and, and all of that. And it's just you know absolutely fascinating. People really don't realize. And I think that's one reason why um, people do get fascinated when you bring up Alaska and you, you put out a work on that state because it just it seems so remote it seems you know so far out there you know of course being called the last frontier and what have you and 
So I can completely understand why people are certainly interested in your work on Alaska. Yeah, and it's kind of, uh, it's sort of one of the last mysterious places, isn't it? Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, people are intrigued by it when they when they even take a cursory look and start understanding that Alaska is a massive state. Uh, you know, I, I usually tell people, I say, you know, you, most people don't realize how big Alaska is because they've seen it maybe on a map if, if they haven't been there. And they kind of have this concept, oh, it's up here in the corner and, you know, it it's juts out a little bit. Well, we'll go online and look at a uh, map of the continental U.S. with Alaska placed over top mm -hmm. of it. And then that will open your eyes. You know, think, oh, my gosh. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, we're yeah, talking Victoria, about Victoria, it's more territory. than twice the size of Texas. Nothing yeah. is. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, it, it is. <laughs> Do you think and, really, I'm sorry. Do you think there really could be a pocket of woolly mammoths hiding out in Alaska? I it's love great. I love those stories. I would love to think so, Come on. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, it's it's probably unlikely. I mean, uh, I, I think that you know we always want to hope that something like that has survived. Uh, you know, there's a few intriguing sightings that uh, have cropped up over the years from remote places like Siberia and so forth. And there's always the chance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that they survived much later than modern science uh, promotes. Okay. Uh, I will say that because there are late Native American tales that talk about these creatures existing. Uh, so, you know, to that degree, I, I think that they were survivors. Uh, but, you know, I always say, who can say, there's so much vast unexplored territory in Alaska and relatively few people uh, that, you know, ever see it. Mm -hmm. So anything really is possible, especially yeah. in a place like that. It's beautiful. David. Let me ask you something, David, because this is a theory that I've been toying with here uh, for a while. So you know, we have all of these uh, planes that have gone missing up in Alaska, you know, dating back decades and decades. Uh, some some of them, you know, very large, some of them are small, but uh, so many of them. And, you know, we attribute that now to the Alaska Triangle, like the Bermuda Triangle and so forth. And one of the ideas is that some of these planes may have disappeared through a portal you know, and has maybe disappeared in some other you know, place in space time or you know, maybe even another point in time. And then you have all these you know, legends about the Thunderbirds, these very you know, large birds, uh, sometimes very loud you know, with these enormous wingspans. The idea that I've been, uh, the theory I've been playing with is the idea that some of these planes, like up in Alaska, have been passing through these portals going back you know, however many, maybe hundreds of years, and they become these sightings of Thunderbirds you know, 500, 600 years ago or whenever they occurred. What do you think? Absolutely. That's, that's something I've considered myself, especially if you look at traditional native stories. Uh, one of the key things that they often say is that a Thunderbird, that the beating of its wings uh, causes the winds to move. Well, you know, what do you feel if a, a jet passes overhead? <laughs> you know, um, and and what would that sound like to someone who'd never seen a plane before? You know, so they would they would perceive it as a massive bird of some kind. Now, I think there's a flip side of that, too, because if we're talking about this portal concept, which that in itself, that, that's something I've looked at very closely through the years. I talk about it some with the strange intruders material and uh, it, it kind of it makes a lot of people, you know, a lot of traditional uh, people say, oh, no, that's that's too metaphysical or woo woo or whatever. And, you know, I would I would redirect them and say, look at quantum science and what they're talking about. Now, they're talking about other levels of existence. Uh, we know these other uh, dimensions of existence are there. We don't know how to get to them. We don't know what's there, but we know they're there. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about a portal concept, you know, this connecting point. Well, what if it does open randomly sometimes? Uh, you know, what if these sightings that people report in modern times of seeing what they describe as a, a petrosaur, you know, a flying dinosaur? Uh, what if it really was just briefly passing through somehow uh, someone in the modern world gets a glimpse 
of the skies of another time, you know, through a portal. I think there's a lot of indications that this may be what's going on. So uh, it's, it's really cool that you're, uh, you know, that you're talking about that from the opposite perspective too, because that's something I've also considered is that, well, that can probably go both ways. And, you know, we certainly have circumstances where people uh, experience strange things for a brief amount of time and feel like they're somewhere else, right? Maybe they slip through. Yeah, absolutely. You hear stories about, you know, you know, these time slips or, you know, maybe seeing mm -hmm. people or events or something of that nature, you know, for a brief moment, or even I, I've you know, heard stories of, you know, people having, you know, conversations with somebody in, you know, in older attire, or they look at yes. them almost as if they're the ghost, you know, there's some sort of, you know, it seems like crossing of dimensions or crossing of point in time. So, yes. You know, all these things are very fascinating. Yeah, ab absolutely. Those those stories are incredible. And they, you know, they're starting to to get some attention in recent years that people are talking about time slips, uh, you know, and, and even the Mandela effect is is somewhat connected to this, I think, because we're talking about alternate versions of things or people remembering things differently. So we really are in a, a time where, you know, perception is being altered. And, you know, as well as I do, Mike, that Alaska is one of those places that it alters your perception. Uh, it, it really does. Uh, there's something about the place. I, I'll be honest with you guys. I don't like the cold weather. You know, I, <laughs> I, I'm, the, I'm the guy that wants to be on the islands. You know, I, I like the, the warm weather. And, um, you know, at the same time, I, I found Alaska, you know, just so in, intriguing. There's something very compelling about it. And there is this mystery that is, it's in the atmosphere there. And as I said a moment ago, there's something about the place that does alter your perceptions somewhat. You know, even even in the cities, uh, there's just there's a different quality. And you go below the surface of, OK, well, yeah, you know, we're living in a or here we are in a climate that's completely different. You know, the people are different. Yeah, there is that. But you even go beyond that. And there's there's something very unique and very different about that place. Yeah, yeah, there truly is. And uh, what I end up telling people is, you know, it's very beautiful. Uh, it's a, an amazing place to visit. You just, you don't want to live there. Having done it for three years. <laughs> you know, it was also, those winters really bear down on you. They're uh, long, they're dark. You know? I mean, it, it's but not still, it's a very beautiful place. And it is very mysterious as well. You're correct on that. Yeah. It's not just a land of lumberjacks, because that's the way I picture it, you know. Lumberjacks? <laughs> <laughs> You know, working on the pipeline, plaid well, jacks, lumberjacks. Well, Let's... there's that. You have people working yeah. on the pipeline. You have a lot of fishing, a lot of hunting. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 You know, there's a, a very strong military presence up there. So. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we're talking about this. Uh, we're talking about this portal concept. And, you know, you dig into the traditional native tales up there. And, um a lot of these these creatures and these different entities that the native people talk about, uh, they talk about them sort of slipping in and out. You know, they're just suddenly there and then they're gone. And uh, we're, we're back to this dimensional concept again, which which really that idea pops up in in traditions all over the world. Uh, so it, it didn't surprise me at all years ago when quantum physics finally said, oh, hey, you know what? <laughs> There's other dimensions. And, you know, I thought, hey, you know what? Uh, I've heard that from Native elders since the 70s. <laughs> Here but you we have go. to admit, right, right. The, the woo woo makes life fun. You know, the weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm done. Yeah. It's, no, it's, it's just funny how, and, and David, you're right. It's, it's just funny to me how, you know, science finally comes along and acknowledges something where you have all these cultures and in their traditions, they've been talking it about it for, you know, millennia, but it right. seems that there's this weird connotation. We're not going to recognize it until science finally puts their stamp of approval on it. And, and says, right. yep, <laughs> it's there. It exists. Yeah. Come on, we've known that. Yeah. yeah. Until some guy in a cubicle writes a paper and says, Hey, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Thanks buddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're at the end of our show here, uh, David, uh, I know I've been putting the banner up here for your site, eerielights.com. Where can everybody find you, your books? I mean, how many books do you have out now? It seems like a million. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, erielights.com is the site to go to. The front page will be uh, all kinds of news, upcoming projects and other things. And there's tons of other stuff, stuff on that site too. Um, you go to the words page, you'll find all the, the recent books. And of course, everything is available at amazon.com. All right. Fantastic. Well, this hour went by extremely fast, but it absolutely did, yeah. appreciate. Yeah. I absolutely appreciate you uh, having you on here, my friend. It's been uh, far too long. So. Oh yeah, definitely. My pleasure, man. It was great talking with you guys. Oh, thanks for asking or asking. Thanks for answering all my questions. <laughs> No I worries. have two more, but I'll ask you later. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, for the next few weeks, Victoria will be hitting you up with all kinds of questions. <laughs> Wait, are you on Twitter? No. <laughs> I'm on Instagram. Uh, eerie Lights on Instagram. Are and, you a teenage uh, girl? What? There's, a, there's a Eerie yeah, Lights. On Instagram too. Come on. Now. Oh, yeah. are you a teenage girl? <laughs> there's an Eerie Lights uh, Facebook page. Uh, and, okay. of course, there's contact form on the Eerie Lights website. Uh, I don't do Twitter because I'm not a teenage girl. So, <laughs> or, or, okay, a, or a politician. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, we got into a huge argument on Twitter today about black eyed kids. I had to block a lot of people. <laughs> oh, wow. So, Guess I missed like, that one. See you later. That's, yeah, that's like the trailer park of social media. So, I kind of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love my Twitters. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David. Well, you have a great evening. We'll have to have you back again soon. Hey, thanks, guys. My pleasure. Take Bye. care. Nice All to meet right. you. Take care. Bye. Bye. There you go. All right. That was David Weatherly, folks. Yeah, he and I go back uh, some years. We used to uh, investigate a lot together. And uh, yeah, so we've had some experiences. <laughs> good guy. Good guy. Very uh, extremely knowledgeable. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Now I have more books to read now. That's okay. That's he I has agree. a lot too. <laughs> yeah, he he mm. has. I have eleven. And he has more than I. So wow, yeah. I have. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm working on Doppler Girl. So there you go, <laughs> Doppler Girl. Yeah, I thought great. you were going to put together you know, like a book on um, different paranormal teas, like entity and paranormal no. activity. Oh, oh, <gasps> the paranormal tea party. There you go. <laughs> Okay, I'm on it. I'm on it. Hey, Chris Sutton, I love this. <laughs> Chris, uh, Coyote Chris Sutton, Mike's right. Victoria will continue to ask questions after the show. They were good ones, though. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Chris. I love Chris. He's fun. He keeps he answering oh, my yeah, questions. He's awesome. He's awesome. <laughs> he's like, God, Victoria. I thought. <laughs> no, he's good. So uh, some people may have noticed that we were simulcasting out to the. Uh, the edge of the rabbit hole Facebook page, as well as the uh, YouTube live stream that we always do something we're kind of, you know, playing with a little bit and see how that uh, might work out for everybody. Um, uh, Alina's moderating the chat for YouTube. So, um, you know, try to get the questions in that way. We're not really going to be moderating the Facebook chat, at least as of this point, but. Um, so Facebook is free to... range. <laughs> I guess I don't know. I don't know how we would do that. I mean, I can Ooh. I can grab a question from there because it it pops up. Like, um, let me see if I can find it here. Because um, we had our buddy. Da, 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 where is it? I know dead air time. Dead air time. So entity. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. I there was a comment in there, and it's probably you know scrolled. It's probably you know passed now. Uh, but Mark Fiorentino was in there on, the, uh, <laughs> on the Facebook and so I was going to pop that up real quick. So I could take a comment from there, but Alina wouldn't be able to moderate that or send it my way to let me know, Hey, there's, cause that's what she does. Yeah. And then I'm like, okay. Awesome. And then I look through the list to find the question. So, all right. So let's go ahead and get to all of those shout outs. So again, thank you, Victoria. Um, You're welcome. Thank you, Alina, for moderating the chat. We'll get to our participants tab here. Did you know you had a special guest watching tonight? What do you mean? Um, Brian Bethel was watching tonight. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. He said he, he was going to tune in. He was going to be watching. And, yeah. Uh, so he's the one that in 1996, that you know, what David was talking about before, where mm -hmm. um, he had reported that. And see. He's a Texan. You know, uh, here we go. See, <laughs> here, here's Michelle. Here's Michelle Taylor out there on Facebook. So see, it, it 
I can't okay. imagine though. So, hey, Michelle. Great to see you, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, Brian's a fellow Texan, so you know we stick together. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. So, all right, participants tab on YouTube. So we have uh, Betty Lange. Oh, wait, I also needed because we had we had a super chat. So where does that report that now? Here, it was Robert Hanna, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not showing it here, but I know we had it. So yes. thank you, Robert. Thanks, Robert. For our super chat superstar for the evening. Yes, yeah, I'm showing up in the list here. I don't know why. Hmm. But, but he's I know in our heart. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we want to thank uh, Betty Lange and Kathy Silento for joining us this evening. Coyote Chris Sutton. Uh, uh, Don <laughs> Godsey, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, Donna Liska, thank you as always. Helen Espinoza, thank you as well. There's Jill Nimchinsky. Uh, always good to see you, Jill. Karen Whitaker, thanks for joining us once again. And Robert Hanna, who's our Super Chat Superstar this evening. Sarah Youssef, thank you for all the questions tonight. TFT Tarot for today, thank you as well. And The Haglin, always great to see you. So, and then let me kind of scroll up here because we already know, we always know that that list forgets people. I know, I, I did see Hunter Road Media's Fairy Queen, Diane Hilbert, in there earlier. Uh, who else? Kind of scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Um, and maybe it got everybody. I don't know. Usually it doesn't. Usually it misses like, <laughs> you know, 10 people at least. Do you have your haunted so, red roast? Behind I me. To, I meant to remind you. But... <laughs> I think we were talking baseball and threw me off. <laughs> oh, that was it. yeah. Yeah. I know Adam Tiller is mm -hmm. probably lurking out there. Oh, we had <laughs> Pung Guy Fung Guy in the house. Pung Guy Fung Guy. Oh, yeah, Pung Guy. Yeah. Yep. And see, there's the eyes. Adam Tillery. He knew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and of course, Nicole was in there earlier this evening. I know she was really tired. She probably went to bed already or crashed out watching or something. Uh oh. <laughs> you know, if she had into tea, it would keep her awake. Just saying. Yeah, yeah. Tea. Maybe she cuts off the caffeine kind of mm. early. So. I get it. Um, <laughs> all right. So next week is uh, demonologist Nathaniel Gillis. We had him on last Ooh. year, I think last June. So I had a really interesting conversation with him. So we invited him back and we are going to continue that conversation. So it'll be a good time. Oh, yeah. Demonology, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I got a bone <laughs> up on that now. <laughs> oh, so, okay. And uh, for <laughs> tomorrow's Beyond the Shadows, so that is a, that's a secret Facebook group. Um, if you're part of the Connected Universe portal, you know how to access that. And we're going to be talking about personal resonance in you. Not, not me, you. <laughs> I started working on the Connected Universe Connect the Dot book. <laughs> the Connected Universe Connect the Dot book. Uh-huh. Because, you know, coloring books are so, gosh, when did I do them? Like six years ago? <laughs> Yeah. So now it's connected dots. Mm -hmm. Connect the dots. Cool. Connect the so universe. Connected, connect the dots. connected universe. Connect the dots. So mm -hmm. I'm sure people would be into that. <laughs> it's got fractals in it, you know. And yeah, that's as far as I got. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So there yeah. is a um, for those looking to to check it out and are not part of the connected universe portal yet. There is a 30 day free trial for that. So go check it out. ConnectedUniversePortal.com. Um, and then you'll, once you're in there, go to the Beyond the Shadow stuff, which is in the member portal. You'll find like all the old live streams there. You'll get all the information how to access the uh, the Beyond the Shadows live stream when we go live. And uh, we'll get you that invite to the, the secret Facebook group where that airs live. And uh, oh, and for those that are part of the Connected Universe portal, member site um you have one last chance to get in a question for the monthly q a because i'm recording it tomorrow and posting it so we do go. that on the portal site or on the secret page um either or i mean okay i would prefer <laughs> it on the the community page where i have you know the question posted on the on the website but if you want to put it on the secret uh facebook page you can do that too so that's fine. I'm going to get one in one of these days. I <laughs> awesome. Knock twice for the secret portal. 
<laughs> there you go. Hey, Victoria yeah, the, sent me. Yeah, the secret <laughs> knock and the secret handshake, and yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. All right, everybody. You have a great night, and I hope to see many of you tomorrow night for Beyond the Shadows. Have a great night. Bye, guys. <laughs> Thank you.